Hi everybody. So I am here to update y'all on the fantastic adventure that was us moving from Portland, Oregon to Tulsa, Oklahoma. You might look at a map and see, okay, that's six states. And then you might look at... <laughs> We'll start over. So you might look at a map and uh, say, okay, that's six states, and you might look at how long it takes. But going by car, a normal route, a normal timeline, Google's gonna tell you it's gonna take about three days. Well, it took us six, and that was by design, but also because of some of the craziness that ensued during our trip. So what are the six states? We went through Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, and finally Oklahoma. So since we're talking about numbers, I'll go through some other numbers on this six state trip. It took us six days. We had three cats and a dog. We had one Prius and this lovely 45 foot Cetra Heideck Highway Coach. And the sort of orientation of all of the living creatures in the vehicle was when we were driving, all of the cats and the dog, Rick's Rocket, who has been with us for all time, would ride with me in the front seat of the Prius. And the cats had kind of a, a little cat kingdom in the back seat. And if you're familiar with the way a Prius is designed, it's a hatchback and the, the seats can fold down. We did not fold the seats down though, did we? What we did was we put two litter boxes in the very back. The cats were able to climb over the seats. They had their carriers. Some of you who are very cautious pet owners might say, oh my god, oh my god, why did you let your cats out while you were driving? Because if I did not, they would have driven me absolutely insane, crying, scratching, howling, treating the entire experience as if it was the absolute end of their lives. And what's fascinating is if I put my cats in their carriers, but then open the carrier doors, they completely calm down and they still spend most of their time either in the carrier or on top of the carrier. That's how we organized all of the living creatures. So before we left Portland, we took the bus from where it had been sitting for two years, which was a, a farm in, um, you know, outside of Oregon City. And we drove it up to our apartment right smack in the middle of Portland, Oregon. One of the busiest streets of Portland, by the way, if you're familiar with Portland, is Burnside. And we parked the bus and we put all of our belongings inside this lovely bus magnolia and um <laughs> We invited friends over. Some of the friends came and actually helped us move stuff. And some of the friends just came over because they'd never seen the bus in person. They'd only seen it in pictures and they wanted to send us off. We invited them inside and they signed the interior walls. Some of them we had to cut out because we installed windows over them. Oops. But yeah, we're very excited. We set off on this journey. We've said goodbye to our friends. We have it organized. So we knew the first day was going to be a short driving day because we knew that we would have been packing all day. We'd be exhausted. So short driving day. We don't even get out of Oregon. I think we get to around the Grand and we find a place. What we decided is we wanted to stay together, both because we like each other, you know, it's uh, we, we actually enjoy each other's company, but also because that way we can help each other out. One of us isn't 100% stuck with the animals in, and trying to get animals into hotel rooms and stuff like that. And yeah, it just felt better all the way around. We decided we're going to stay in rest stops. And the first night we find some rest stop around La Grande, Oregon, wake up the next day and the Prius is dead. Well, luckily my very smart partner, Patrick, had paid for this service called CoachNet, roadside assistance for large rigs. We were able to use it for the Prius as well. We had killed the battery somehow, easy fix. So we thought, all right, well, this is not the greatest start to our day, but it's all right. We'll get on the road and everything, everything will be fine. Famous last words. That same day <laughs> we blew a tire on the bus. I'm driving behind Patrick, I see the tire blow. I see all of this debris from the tire flying all over the road. So we pull over on the side of the road. We're still in Oregon. We have not left the state yet. And it's a Sunday too, which is important because apparently nobody works on Sundays. We're stuck on the side of the road. We call CoachNet again. They are very concerned for us. They're very friendly. They call Highway Patrol and they come and check on us. Long story short, there is one tow truck driver and after six hours of us sitting on the side of the road, this tow truck driver happens to have a tire that 
it is the right size that is in good enough condition and i think we pay like 500 bucks for it or something like that he takes our wheel off goes and installs the tire brings it back and puts it on for us the police came and checked on us a few times asked us if we needed water if we needed food and we were fine we just all crammed into the prius because the prius is the only vehicle that has climate control in this lovely story so patrick is stuck all day driving in the bus that has no climate control the best we had for him was wetting some towels that were specifically designed to be cooling towels. You've probably seen these. And also we bought him this fan that goes around your neck and like tries to cool off <laughs> this area. I'm sure it worked a little bit for a little while, but it was not enough because this is the last couple days of July and the first couple days of August when we're doing this drive. It's like hovering around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which for our non-American friends is around 37, 38 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that was, <laughs> A, a tough beginning and so what patrick decided to do was he said you know what i am going to keep this bus on cruise control around 55 miles per hour and i'm not going to go any faster because with the heat the way it was we were concerned that going fast we were concerned that going fast would cause potentially another blowout because we have not had a chance to replace any of our tires. We don't know how old they are. You know, we know that this bus was sitting for a long time. These tires are at least many, many years old. So yeah, I'm really glad he made that decision. And that's one of the reasons it took us so long. The other reason it took us so long is that many of you know this, if you're in bus life, driving a bus is exhausting. And thinking that you can drive eight, 10, 12 hours a day, which maybe is uh, reasonable in a car, is not really reasonable in a bus because it requires so much concentration and it's just a whole different experience. We were really trying to limit it to between five and seven hours a day. Obviously it took us a little bit longer since we were doing all that. And I guess the last thing is just that we were pretty impressed with the rest stops. You know, there was only one rest stop the whole time that we just thought this is not a comfortable experience. And that was in Wyoming. It was very windy. There were no green areas. The truck part was completely packed full. And so even though magnolia is a large bus she is not as big as those guys so and there was somebody beside us we ended up having to move somebody beside us was using a, a gas generator you know the the fumes were coming into our bus and it was just not a good experience but most of the rest stops were awesome there were a lot of green areas there were great dog parks and all the various rest stops and the one in kansas had a beautiful like breathtaking sunset we had kind of originally thought we're going to cook meals. We had lots of different types of meals kind of planned out. We already bought an induction cooktop that will end up going in the bus in the kitchen. We thought, well, we'll just, we can use that and we can just cook these one pot meals and it'll be fine. You know, we did that exactly once <laughs> because again, the entire experience was so exhausting trying to make sure that the cats and Rick's Rocket were happy and okay. So our routine ended up being, we would find our rest stop for the night we wanted to make sure that we parked well before it got dark so we wanted to stop 5 6 p.m something like that i had this kind of playpen for the cats if you're familiar with these it's enclosed and it's built for cats it's got lots of good air circulation and stuff in there one of my cats really liked to explore and so i had them on their harnesses and he would go and explore that was pretty cool and we'd walk rick's rocket and make sure that he was good yeah and then we would usually i can't even remember what we ate to be honest but it was it was not home cooked food that's for sure <laughs> but i think a lot of times we would get something i think i think that we just said you know what this is just going to be an expense it is good for our mental health <laughs> that's what we decided yeah, we uh we pulled into tulsa it was like the second or third day of august it was over 100 degrees outside my mom and my sister had come over to our little rental house and fixed it all up for us they would put a bed in our bedroom my mom gave us her couch that she was replacing it was just such a nice thing family came over the next morning and helped us unload that was august of 2023 and here we are it is august of 2024 and our lease goes until the end of february 2025 so our goal is to move into magnolia right around that time i'm gonna get off of here and start helping patrick Let's talk a little bit about the windows. When we first bought Magnolia, the only thing the previous owner had done is remove the seats and half of the bathroom. Toilet was gone. The black tank was filled with the expandable foam. 
thank you. But half of the walls were gone, half of them were still there. At any rate, all the seats were gone except for the three in the very back. And we thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. Windows are there, double pane. We'll leave the windows in. After a while, we realized we can't do that because we've got to do a roof raise, which means we've got to take the windows out. I didn't trust myself, didn't trust us to do a roof raise without breaking all of the windows. Those windows have got to go. That's a story all on its own. Okay, let's go back in time. From the beginning, we wanted to make a tiny house, but I suggested an old school bus and uh, Jamie loved that idea. So we went looking. Our plan had been to not buy a bus for an, at least another year. We had a three-year plan, but me being who I am, I started looking at what was available just to see. And then this large coach bus showed up on Facebook Marketplace of all places. And um, I remember I called her in to see it. She looked at the pictures and said, beautiful. Look at all those windows. We can just leave it as is and do what we want. That didn't work out. We wanted to make it a home and to have a home we wanted residential windows. We decided on that pretty much from the beginning. I had my doubts but yeah we decided to go for it. All of our windows but one come from the Habitat for Humanity Restore in Portland. That one that doesn't comes from the Habitat for Humanity Restore here in Tulsa and it's actually very close to our house so we go there all the time to see if they have anything special or anything unique and really cool which they often do and it's really really a cool place. So I'm encouraging you to go visit your local restore. So we've got all our windows there. The problem with that is we had to sort of take what we could get, what we would find. None of them are really the same. Each one is unique and that required a sort of a unique and individual installation. But they were beautiful. RV windows, uh, not a big fan, no. I want windows with curtains and windows you can open and feel like, feel like a house. That was important to us and so we did that. We always wanted our inside walls to be perpendicular to the floor, more or less. Nothing is square on a bus and then the, the slight curve in the roof we could maintain but the actual curve on the skin of the bus, we wanted to not reflect that on the interior. And once it made things a little bit easier for the windows and still we had to deal with the curve of the the skin of the bus now a lot of buses made these days school buses in particular ricks where are you going buddy come here Bobo. it's doggo daddy day ricks had to go to the vet this morning Hello, buddy so i decided to bring him out here with me oh you a good boy you such a good boy he's my baby where was I? Most of these buses have straight walls. They're basically rectangles. Our bus is a Cetra. It's a German design. So we've got that subtle European styling with this very subtle curve. Really nice. I like it. But it made for some difficult window installation and I struggled. Mm. Oh, it was so mm. hard trying to figure out how to install these. Residential windows have very special, unique needs and they're made for houses with framing and stuff. So how do I install these things in here? This is not my lane. This is the lane way, way over there. I went to YouTube University, but all I could find was how to install residential windows in residences. Go figure. So I finally came to a conclusion that the best way to do it is to frame the window out as if it was going into a residence and then install that frame, that box, into the bus somehow. The biggest problem was because of the curve of the bus, we knew that something might stick out or in because of the top was narrower than at the bottom, especially if we wanted the inside walls to be perpendicular. So I realized what we had to do is we take the top of the, the window, put that even with the top of the frame, the, the cutout we were going to make, and then and deal with everything sort of inside the bus as far as sticking out except for one window which caused nothing but problems anyway i made a template here we have a uh, a template for a jack stud i learned the terminology for installing windows headers jack studs sills and the cripples are the little things that go underneath and i thought i'm going to do it exactly like that there's going to be a header and the jack studs are going to come underneath the header and a sill is going to be inside the jack studs and the cripples will come down from the jack stud to the beam luckily we have a beam a metal beam square tubing and this this is a solidly built bus so we had this one beam that ran the full length of the bus right at the perfect height for this to sit on. This is what this is for. This is a full width. And then as it goes up, it starts to taper in. And this was the um, template I used for all of the jack studs. And of course, each installation, each point of installation was unique and, and not quite the same. And this didn't quite match up with every single one. This is the one I, I got from the first window we did, which I'll show you here. But it was close enough that I could finesse the jack studs to get them to fit somewhat close enough. God, I love butyl tape. I also do this with the header because the header had to be flush or even with this but had to be in an angle like that once i had that figured out what i did was i made each frame unique to each window then i had to install the frame to the bus before putting the window in the frame now i always made it slightly larger quarter inch space around each window and i used shims i'm getting ahead of myself which i do i install the frames onto the bus before i put the windows in that's what i'm trying to get at oh the chickens are out free range chickens as you can tell. So I installed the frames into the bus prior to putting the windows in the frames. I measured, of course, I double checked, put a quarter inch space around each window. Didn't always work out that well because buses are not square. Anyway, to install the frames, I used two different methods. Down at this point on the jack stud, I used self-tapping wood to metal screws right through here and into the beam. And that tied it into the frame. Now, 
When you come up here, the skin of the bus comes down here. We used self-topping sheet metal roofing screws, the kind with the rubber washer on the inside, and did those into the jack studs, the header, and the sill. And that pulled the skin of the bus into the frame like that. And then when we installed the windows, we made sure that this point where the skin was here, it was flush with that, and then it came down straight. They are nice and solidly attached, trust me. Then I decided from that point, I'm going to start treating it like a regular window installation. I put down window flashing tape. It didn't always work out. Because it's a sheet metal skin it's kind of sticking to, and I couldn't get the curve right, and I didn't know what I was doing half the time, which is not unusual. And then to put the window in, we used a lot of shims. I wanted to try and maintain that quarter inch space all the way around. Most of the time we did. A couple times it got really dicey because it would it wasn't square and it would sort of stick in a corner. And But most of the time it was pretty good. We were able to screw through the shims into the frame of the windows most of the time. Sometimes we had to go from the frame of the window into the frames, cut the shims off on the inside, and uh, filled the space with self-expanding foam. That was it for the inside installation. Window was installed. For the trim, on the outside, we used regular framing lumber that we got at Lowe's. Cut it to the size I wanted, got it all set up to hide the roofing screws. We just cut holes. Bricks, come here, buddy. Don't do that. You're gonna knock, you're gonna knock over my, my camera. Good boy. He's a good boy. To accommodate the roofing screws, we cut holes in the trim pieces and laid them over so that the, the heads of the roofing screws would stick out into the holes and not cause the trim to be, you know, wackadoo. The trim was attached to the skin of the bus using Sikaplex 221. Love that stuff. When I was boat building, I learned that that is the go-to sealant and adhesive, and I've been using it ever since. And on this, on this build, we've used it everywhere. The trim pieces are stuck to the skin of the bus with 221. Clamped them on as best we could. The side pieces had to deal with the curve of the bus as well. So I used ratchet straps. I'd hook one to the bottom of the bus, bring it all the way over the side of the bus to the other side of the bus, hook it in, and then use that with a couple of wedges on the trim piece just to sort of tighten it up. And then I'd reef on the uh, the ratchet and use that as a clamp. And that did a really good job. I'm not uncomfortable with driving a bus with residential windows. I know that a lot of people have opinions. Welcome to the internet. But that's okay. I'm feeling pretty confident we're going to do fine. A lot of people have done this before us. A lot of people haven't because they're afraid of it. I'm not worried. You know, if I'm wrong, I'm the first one to admit it. And we'll come back here and will say, oops. But right now I'm feeling comfortable and confident and we're pretty happy with the way things turned out. Let's talk about the paint job. After we'd done the roof raise and put the sheet metal on the bus, we realized we're going to have to paint the bus. Couldn't just drive around with that sheet metal all the time. And trust me, driving a big metal box, the heat of the Southwest, not so much fun. Oh my God, it was like driving a sauna, especially if you don't have any air conditioning. So we knew we were going to have to paint it. So we had best intentions. We got a sprayer. That's what we'll do. We'll use that. When we got to the point where we're ready to actually do it, I did a lot of body work. Rust holes that needed to be repaired that I discovered after I started to sand it. There were things that needed to be pulled or filled in. That took a while. I'd never done Bondo before. I'm an expert now. So I did all that. We had an idea for colors. I wanted it to be have a, have a sea and sky kind of a feel to it. So a two-tone. And we had some colors picked out. Basically automotive colors, automotive enamel. Yeah, it was. they were nice. I liked it. Jamie and I went to a, an automotive paint specialist in here in Tulsa, just down the road from our house. I'm thinking, that'll work out. We've known people that have done that. We've talked to people and we've seen videos of people spraying their buses with automotive enamel and it worked out great. Outside, in the sun, in the wind. Anyway, this guy at this place, I won't tell you where it was. So it's a very nice store. I'm sure he's a really nice guy. He was so discouraging. He talked about how difficult it would be, how horrible the look would be. Rick's Rocket, where are you going, buddy? Come here. You're okay. All he did was talk about how bad it would look. Doing it outside, you know, you'll get a bug in it. The wind will cause some problems and the spray will be everywhere and it's going to look horrible. And how many coats are you going to clear coat? No? Okay. And it's going to be expensive. You'll get one part done and it won't match up with the next part. It was just horribly discouraging. I walked in thinking, this is going to be great. We're going to get this sorted out. We're going to paint the bus. I was so excited. And we walked out thinking, oh, God, this is going to be impossible. <gasps> All right. Good boy. We walked out of there really, really dejected. How are we going to do this? We even thought we were going to have it done professionally. We'd call somebody up, get an estimate. The guy we did call said, well, we don't have a shop that big. I don't know what to do. And then we realized how much is that going to cost? We sat and we had a good talk. We realized, you know what? This is not a car we're going to put into show. This is not a restored 1978 Trans Am. Remember those? Or a 1968 Mustang Fastback. Oh my God, I'm dating myself. This is not going to be a car we stuck in a garage when it rained. So we sat down and we just lowered our standards quite a bit and thought, okay, let's roll on the paint. People have done this many times before. So we went to YouTube University for this and we saw one particular video, which I might link to down below, very helpful, where he did comparisons. He talked about the problems, the orange peel effect that happens, which we do have. I'll be buffing that out. And he was very helpful not only with that, but also in how to prepare for it in the mixing of the can. So we decided we were going to roll it on and we were going to use <laughs> tractor paint. Why not? It's made for rough and tough, made to go on tractors and farm implements. It's made to be really sturdy. So we went to a tractor supply. 
we got some New Holland blue Ford tractor paint. Somebody on, on Instagram already recognized that. And there's like two colors of blue. There's Ford blue and there's the New Holland blue, which is a different, just a new Ford blue. So we want a two-tone. What we decided to do was basically use some white tractor paint, add in some of the New Holland blue and get that different tone. And that worked out really well. We did a nice experiment with that. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it worked out really well. So we took one gallon of New Holland blue, put it in a five gallon bucket, mixed it up. To that one gallon, we added 96 ounces of thinner, which is just a little bit less than a gallon. I'm from Canada. We don't do gallons there. Then we put in 16 ounces of Penetrol, which is a product that we were told would make it a little bit glossy, make the paint go on smoother, helps it flow better, helps it adhere better, which was important to us. Also to that eight ounces of an enamel hardener catalyst that was the same brand as the paint. That was also for toughness and just to, again, make it adhere better. Toughness was important. Glossiness, not so much, but you know, we wanted a little bit of it. So that was a five gallon bucket with about two gallons of paint in it, all mixed up, looking really good. Before we did that, we did two coats of primer, flat gray tractor paint, <laughs> flat gray tractor paint primer mixed with thinner. So it would go a little bit farther. Uh, two coats of that, that went on really easily. And I'll tell you, there's a picture of it. Once the bus was no longer that original blue and that sheet metal, boy, and it all, all it was all one uniform color, what a difference just that made. We did three coats of the blue, and then we went and we did the top. Now, to get the second color for the top, we took that white tractor paint, put a gallon to that, and mixed it up with the Penetrol, the thinner, and the hardener, just like we did that, uh, the Holland Blue. But then we took a little cup and we did a few ounces at a time of the pre-mixed blue paint until we got the tone we wanted. Turns out it was about 12 ounces, and we got our second color. And here it is. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. We are very satisfied. Jamie loves it. We're both very happy with this. The center line where the rivets are, we've got some Brazilian mahogany that a friend of ours happened to get, sold us a lot of it. It was a pretty good deal. You can't find this stuff. It's it's a hardwood, much like teak. It doesn't rot. Well, not really. It has a nice, really sort of a grayish, reddish gray patina if it's not finished. It takes oil and varnish really well, and it really blossoms at that point. I used it a lot in boats. So you see the hull deck joint on a sailboat is almost all always with a piece of teak or, or, or mahogany. It hides the joint and it really gives it a nice trim. That's what we're going to do here. We're going to take some of that, we're going to cut it to size, and we're going to put it along the center of the bus. So we're going to uh, oil it, and if I have to oil it every year, every six months, and that's what I'm going to do. It's just part of the regular maintenance. It looks that good. We're going to hide the rivet line, hide the joint between the two tones of paint, and um, give it some real, real appeal. And it's going to be great. And I'm very happy with uh, the way it came out.